Well, good evening, everyone. My name is C. Mildred Thompson. Though for most of my life, I was known as Professor Thompson. But don't worry, I am not here to lecture you. Besides, I didn't spend all my time within the ivy-covered walls of academia. I marched with suffragettes, advocated for education, and campaigned for presidents. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was among my closest friends. I was born in 1881, right here in Atlanta, right after Reconstruction, the period following the Civil War. Now remember Reconstruction because it will come up again. But don't worry, there won't be a quiz. As a child, I often dreamed of faraway places and fascinating people. It seems like my life didn't really begin until I went far away to college, to Vassar in New York. College inspired me. In 1903, I graduated with honors. And in 1906, I entered Columbia University Graduate School to study history. Now, Columbia was not co-educational and would not be for decades, so I found myself in a world where I was often the only woman. At Columbia, I studied under a famous scholar named William Archibald Dunning, and I was known as one of the Dunning men because I was the only woman. In 1915, the Dunning School published books based upon our graduate research. And my book on Reconstruction in Georgia was considered the best of the series. Many reviewers noted that I was the only woman writer included. Now, 25 years after my book was published, an interviewer asked me what I would change about my research if I could go back. And thinking it over, I realized that I would write the story much differently. Oh, I had scoured the past for facts and figures, but I'd fallen into a trap of many historians. My own bias. My preconceived ideas of the world had blinded me, and I had eliminated a significant part of the story. Now, correcting errors or omissions born of ignorance or prejudice is not rewriting history. So I told the interviewer that if I could go back I would focus more on the contributions made by formerly enslaved citizens to secure and maintain their own freedom. And that was very different from the Dunning point of view. Now, by the time my book was published, I had earned my PhD and was teaching at Vassar, eventually becoming dean of the college. Education was my passion, but I was not some dusty old professor. I marched for women's rights to vote in suffrage parades, advocated for international education initiatives, and even served as chair of the Women's Division of the Democratic National Committee. I campaigned for Franklin Roosevelt's re-election, even though I was quite vocal in my opposition to some of his policies. But it was about that time that I met his wife, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and we became fast friends. Oh, she had a great sense of humor and was known for her wisdom. She once said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And that was a life lesson I had to learn as the only woman in so many powerful situations. Now, the 1940s saw my career take off in new ways. I was a frequent public speaker and a guest on radio programs. In 1943, I was the only woman delegate from the U.S. to attend the Conference of Allied Ministers of Education in wartime London. And I also attended the conference for the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, was founded. Now, even after retiring from Vassar, I continued to travel and to teach, including several years at the University of Georgia. Now, 
As I had become a public figure and was so outspoken, many journalists tried to get the better of me, challenging my progressive views on women's rights. At one speaking engagement, I strode to the podium in my high heels and announced that there was nothing men did that women couldn't do better, including wearing pants. One journalist in the audience responded with an article listing all the things I couldn't possibly do, such as growing a long silky mustache just like his. <laughs> How I relished those exchanges. You know, what's the fun in life if you can't have a spirit of debate? But no one lives forever, even though I was so busy I could barely find a convenient time to die. But in 1975, at the age of 93, I came to rest here in Oakland with no regrets. So many of my childhood dreams had come true. Let me leave you with one of my favorite Eleanor Roosevelt quotations. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. So never stop learning and dream on. Thank you.